that image up there, can you, can you relate to that at all? Maybe today, maybe last week, last couple months, pandemic time. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Or you might feel like that. You look composed on the outside, but that's how you feel inside. I think a lot of us could probably relate. Anybody know the story of David Brainerd? Anyone heard that one before? No. Okay. This was new to me, too, so I, I learned this this week. So I found it interesting, and hopefully it'll be a good segue into what we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and read you the story. I don't have it up on the It would have been a lot of words on the slide, so I'm just going to read it tonight. Okay, back in the early days of the American colonies, David Brainerd was known as the Apostle to the Indians. In 1739, after three years of study at Yale Divinity School, including studies of local Indian languages, Brainerd made his way toward a hostile Indian tribe living in the dense forests of the Forks of the Delaware, an area including parts of what we know today as New Jersey and Pennsylvania. He arrived near one of the villages late one evening and decided to spend the night in the woods before approaching them the next morning. He didn't realize that several Indians had been following him for hours, and once he was settled in his campsite, they went out onto the village and reported this to the chief. That night, the Indians set out to kill him because up until then, white men had brought them nothing but grief. So these warriors silently drew near Brainerd's camp as he was on his knees praying. While he was praying, uh, the Indians who were watching him saw a large rattlesnake approach him, lift its head, flick its forked tongue close to his face, and then for no apparent reason glide away into the darkness. This made the chief and his warriors very nervous, and instead of killing him, they returned to their village. When Brainerd entered the village the next morning, he received a better welcome than he expected. It wasn't until later that he learned of the strange event of the rattlesnake the preceding night. When the Indians gathered around him, he opened his Bible, read from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, and tenderly told the story of how God sent his son to die on the cross, that he might take away sin from people's hearts and make them his children. This message was warmly received, both in the village and later among many other Indian villages in the surrounding area. As the years passed in the, in the pages of Brainerd's diary, he wrote of how he endured hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. His suffering, caused by disease, were intensified by the rigors of life among the Indians, and his difficult travels in the wilderness as his ministry spread among those areas of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. It's recorded that Brainerd faithfully sowed the gospel among these people and watered it with his prayers and tears until his death in 1747. So, why wasn't he bitten by that rattlesnake that day? I'm not sure. Why did it happen when, just when they were about ready to kill him? Again, I don't know. Did God have anything to do with it? Possibly, right? I don't know the answers to those things, but it's intriguing, and I, and I want to start with, I want to use that as a, as a lead-in to what we're going to talk about with Psalm 91. So I tried to put most of the verses up here on the slides for you tonight, but you're welcome to, to follow along in your Bibles if you'd like. So to get some answers maybe to some of those questions, though, we'll take a look at Psalm 91 to start. I'm going to read that for you. First two verses. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, whom I trust. Do you think of God as your shelter and refuge? All right, let's break down this, this passage a little bit here. So that, that phrase dwells in the shelter, right? dwelling in something, to stay, permanence. Um, God wants us to dwell 
in that shelter. We want to be protected by God. I think there's comfort in that. Right? This, uh, I think I put this picture up here because it reminds me of uh, the, the pavilion at camp. Tyler, you know what I'm talking about? It kind of looks like that. So I think that's why there's, there's comfort in that too. So yes, dwelling in something. Permanence. Staying there. So how do we do that? How do we draw near to God? How, how are we in the shelter and the keeping of God? Through our faith. Our faith? Through our faith. Through our faith, yeah. Good. And spending time in his word. Yeah, really really diving into the word, right? Understanding what, what we are to do, how we are to do it, how we are to conduct ourselves, our interaction with others, our relationship with God. is A lot of that stems from understanding what the word says, right? If we don't know what it says... It's hard to proceed with that. Prayer. Prayer? Absolutely. Our associations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our being with people of like minded. Like minded people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Company we keep, sure. All of those things, right? Mm-hmm. Seeking a relationship with Him. I want to share a thought or two on the concept of fellowship, too, with God. I want to go to 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. So. The Apostle John is talking about this relationship. He says at the last part of chapter or of verse 3, he says, Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Just a couple verses later in that same passage, he says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The first part of that verse is curious to me, right? It says, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness. What would be a good description? Those things almost don't seem like they belong in the same sentence, right? Claiming fellowship, yet doing this. Any words come to mind when you think of that kind of a disconnect between two things? Anything else? Okay. Yeah, I was thinking of a word starting with H. That was the one I was thinking of. Yeah, do we see that? Do we encounter that with people that we know? Hopefully, it's not us, but to an extent, aren't we all guilty of that sometimes? Judy, yeah. Sometimes we can be, right? Yeah, and that's why I think the self reflective piece is so important. Are we taking inventory? Are we looking at ourselves, right? I made kind of a joke, I think, last uh, Sunday night. I made a joke, about, I made a Michael Jackson joke about, the, I said the great theologian Michael Jackson once said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. Right? But without self-reflection, in all seriousness, though, right? Our, we can let our guard down. We can lose our way. We will stumble. But there's a difference between walking in the light, right, a lifestyle where we're striving for that versus seeking God when it's convenient or when we can fit him in. Yeah? If we we don't reflect on our lives, we don't see sin. Yeah. I mean, we have to be constantly watching our own lives. That's scary to think that you could miss it, right? Or be unaware or, like, just negligent, not, you get so accustomed or maybe comfortable, complacent with something that you forget that, mm, I don't know. So when I heard that you called this, that we need to keep dwelling yeah. in the faith and by that dwelling, we're not... That's a scary thought too, right? So I heard that. Yeah. So <laughs> we got some good uh, tree analogies coming up too, so. Steve? It's like we're looking at them from up here, right? But, but instead, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things. That's a great point. We need to really um, be self-aware. It's very easy to look around us. 
But this idea of being all in. I'm the type of person when it comes to something, like if it's a project or something else, like I, I want to do it well. Right? If, it's, if my work's on display for somebody to see, if somebody's going to come look at something at my house that you know, I was the project manager behind it, like I want it to look how I think it should look, right? The concept of being all in, I want to do it well. Um, and I think that concept really applies here too. We, we can't just visit the shelter, right? The shelter of God. When we think it's convenient for us, right? We need to be committed. Um, how can you expect to, to reap the full benefits of something when you're on the fence about Christ? When you haven't fully accepted him, when you haven't given your life over to him in baptism, or being clothed with him in baptism, how can you expect to enjoy all the benefits of this relationship with God when you're not fully in? Right? And that doesn't mean that we won't stumble and fall and have weak moments and need someone to pick us up. We will. But have you thought of God as your shelter? Do you think of him that way? Yeah, David. Yeah, I was just don't want to say too much in the beginning, but as we think of this concept, as we're, you know, going through it, you know, Psalm 91, you know, shelter, um, we think of, the, I talk about biblical faith all the time, and then also in, in verse 2 there it says, may God, and my God in whom I trust, right? And so it all gets back to this idea of obedience, right? So when you're, when you're back there in verse 1, and you look at 91 and 1, you know, talking about obedience, looking at 1 John that you pulled up on the screen, you know, it, it really gets back to how do I enter into that, that relationship? Well, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right. You know, John 14 and 6, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except through me. But it's only through him. There's one way. With, with, a, with an obedient faith right. that puts their trust fully in God. Yeah. And then all this, a lot of the rest of the stuff starts to work mm -hmm. itself out. Yeah, I appreciate that. Ed? I think uh, God would rather have us live our lives uh, day to day with the feeling that we're under his shelter rather than like a lot of people, they run to the shelter when they need the, the protection. Right. And they, they only go there when things aren't going right, they need to go back to God. So almost the prayer is a last resort mindset then as that's the first thing we do. Right? That's, yeah. You ever seen a dead branch on your lawn? The thing about it is that it's dead, right? It's disconnected from the source of life. I had, I had this tree in my front yard. Well, I had, had, past tense. I remember this guy pulled up working for the city, and he's like, oh, yeah, that needs to come down. And I, part of me was kind of, you know, Tyler and I always I marvel that only God can make a tree, right? But he said, that's got to come down. And I knew this day would come, and I enjoyed many days looking out the window and watching the leaves on that thing change and the bright reds coming in and, I could see that the tree was kind of dying because like only the leaves would be on part of it. Like well, that left side's kind of going. So it's, it's on borrowed time. And then they finally took it, took it down the other day. And I remember where it was. And there's a little mound there. But when those branches are off, when they're disconnected from the source, from the vine, they're dead. Right? Christ said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's from John 15, 5. I love that tree analogy. It's so simple, but it's so beautiful too. Right? What is a branch without its source of strength? What does it do? What weight can it bear? I watched that tree slowly start to fade away, right? And get a little weaker. This branch started to kind of break, and I just watched it kind of slowly, by piece by piece, come apart until they finally took it off. It's kind of like the Christian as, you know, the different soils, the different heart conditions, mm -hmm. but also, like, even those, you know, those Christians that you can see it in their lives, you know, where, you know, you miss a Sunday, you miss a Wednesday, and you're like, oh, that, you know, I feel a little bad, but, you know, I'm just busy, I got a lot of stuff going on, and then next week comes around, oh, Next thing you know, two, three, four, maybe five, six weeks go by, and all of a sudden you're like that branch that's disconnected from the source, mm -hmm. and you start to wither away slowly. Yeah. Harder to come back sometimes.
There. Uh, go ahead, Judy. Yeah. He warns us about not forsaking the assembly. The assembly. Because when we do, we really lose touch. Yeah, I agree. It's nice to be here. Um, there's a comfort in this building. It's just a building. Tyler and I always talk about how we're probably more attached to this place than we should be. But we have a lot of memories here, good ones. Yeah. Uh, but there's a comfort here. There's a familiarity here. When I think of my little house in Trenton, I think of these things. Right? I, when I think of my home, I long to be home when I'm at work. Some of you can probably relate. I'd rather be home. There's a comfort, there's a familiarity, there's a peace. Uh, it's warm when it's cold outside. Or in the summer, it's cool. It's a refuge from the heat. It's calming. But the building is not the church. But the building is not the church. When we're told not to forsake the assembly, mm -hmm. we just we need each other so much. When Ed and I were in Italy and we couldn't uh, drive our cars on certain Sundays, we walked to each other's houses, each other's houses, mm -hmm. like we did, like the early Christians did, and it was. Special that we went to the trouble to walk somewhere, and then we did spend, you know, four to eight hours together on that Sunday and fellowship. It, it, it was amazing, and we have a very, very small group of people, but we have two very dear, still close friends, couples, being so far away from home and work and worshiping under extremely different circumstances than here, but still quite able. Yeah. Get such That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Judy. So yeah, so I, th I think of, when I think of my home, I think of those things, but it's a different feeling with the people that are in it. But do you think of God that way? Do you think of God as your shelter? Those attributes that I described at my house, which I enjoy being in. Yeah. But do you think of God the Father that way, as a, as a comfort, a source of peace, safety, refuge, protection, warmth? Think of him that way. Yeah, my house is falling apart. You know, it's like oh. it's getting old. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like it's like it's turned into a relic. <laughs> I'm not convinced. I think I got a 30-year roof or something, but who knows if they installed it right? I think I. In, in answer to your question about do we do, do we are we able to view God in that way of uh, the shelter? Mm -hmm. I thinking back, I did it for a long time. Right, the words were there, the understanding, the position, but finding myself in hard times, you know, being out of work or just really putting something heavy that you can't get over in front of God. Mm -hmm. uh, a few of those, and it's it's amazing what, not that the walk is easy, all right? not that I don't stumble more often than I want to admit, but it, to, to hear that question, it's 100% in my mind that God's running the show and he knows who I am and he provides for me. And I can't thank him enough. Thank you. Somebody else have a hand up? No, phantom hand, okay. So I want to go back to 91, Psalm 91. I appreciate all the comments, too, by the way. That's nice. It's, I hear crickets at work, so it's nice to hear comments. Uh, I've even been opening class with jokes, and it, there's still crickets. So maybe the jokes aren't good. I don't know. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God whom I trust, right? The Psalms are so beautiful, by the way, too. Yeah, go ahead. There is a deceit in the very first line. Mm -hmm. He who dwells. You have to make a decision that you're going to dwell in the shelter of the most high. Because if you don't make that decision, you choose it, yes. If you don't make that decision, you're not going to be in the shelter. Right. about the children of Israel when they came out of uh, Egyptian slavery, right? They get out there and God's talking with Moses and he basically sends down some edicts and they, they agree. They say, you know, you know, all that you say, we will do. And they enter into that first covenant relationship, right? Obviously paraphrasing. And so they enter into that covenant relationship and then it was only just a few short days later they're building a golden calf. Right? And so you it just came out think, that way. Yeah, it just came out that way. It came out that way. 
but it, when you think about that, that's why there's so much uh, truth into the idea of the trust, like what Tyler was mentioning, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you, you have some of those hard moments, some of those storms of life, to be able to really truly trust God while still being obedient, while in the storm, is in the shadow. That's what the shadow's talking about. And that's where you would want to be, right? We would all, you would all yeah. assume, or we would assume that that's where we want to be, right? When, when times get hard. Amen. Sometimes I think about people that I know or other, you know, just maybe people that I've encountered, acquaintances that, that don't have any kind of a, a church affiliation or any kind of, and when those times really do hit, what do you really have? Know, and I, I'm glad that I don't have to really think about, like, I'm, I'm so grateful for what we have here at Lincoln Park and the body here and the choice that people make to be here. And there's, there's strength in numbers, as Steve was saying. There's a lot of comfort, and there's so many people here that would, would pretty much do anything for their neighbor, right? And there's a lot of you that, that know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. So there's this idea of peace and comfort. But we have to be all in, right? You need to make God your reference refuge, as Stephen was saying. You need to choose that, and we can reap the benefits of it. That relationship with God is special. Anybody know what a follower is? Go ahead, Stephen. A what? Hold that. I want to read verse, uh, go, we're kind of staying in Psalm 91, so kind of the way this lesson was set up, it kind of moves us through the successive verses, so it says in beginning of verse 3, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge, his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. So, What is a fowler? A uh, bird trapper. Okay. Right. A bird trapper. Right? So, in the context of this passage, then, who is the fowler? Satan. All right, good. Right? So, we can be ensnared. We've talked about that, the, the wiles of the devil. Um, I think, Pat, you were mentioning something the other day about how that manifests and we, we need to know our enemy. I think Judy said something about that in class the other day. We need to know what we're up against, but we still maybe won't know exactly how it's going to happen or when it's coming, but we have to be on our guard, right? Like he, the scripture talks about him prowling around like a lion, waiting to devour someone. So if the follower in this passage is supposed to be Satan, how are we ensnared? How does that happen? Inside, outside. Okay. There's a lot of ways, right? You, you know, too, that even if you are guarded on the inside, even if you resist temptation on the inside, people can still um, create problems to ruin your reputation. You got, you know, and ministers have to be especially careful. Um, I was reading a fictional novel where one of the characters, he starts out in a cult, then he gets married and becomes a legitimate preacher, but the millionaire, the father-in-law is controlling things. But they have to watch out for a particular type of woman who likes to chase preachers. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> What's the title of that one? Um, it's a curse, Patrick. The <laughs> Enchanter, <laughs> uh, something like that. Okay, that's well. That sounds yeah. Divine but your but your point 
Yeah, your point is a good one, though, Judith. I appreciate that. So we're, we're in, there's a lot of ways that we can be ensnared. Maybe not always in the same way. Right? But this idea of protection, right? I, I, I was kind of drawn to a couple words there. So back to this idea of refuge and shelter, almost like safety, safe harbor, um, safe haven maybe. In verse 4, his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. That's really small. Sorry for how small that is. It looks good on my screen. Uh, Merriam-Webster defines rampart as a protective barrier, right? Or an embankment that's used like as a fortification. Well, it's a defense. So I think you think of like a, like a parapet or a castle wall, something that's erected to provide a layer of protection, right? Something that's hard to, hard to scale or hard to get through. So we think of those things when we think of God. Do we think of him as our shield, as our protector, our rampart? I think we do, maybe not in those terms, but I think it shouldn't be lost on us that that is the nature of that relationship, right? He is our protector. Verse 5 says, You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. So I have this, this story, this other story, story number two, that I wanted to read to you. So this comes from... Uh, back in the 1800s, 1876. I don't know how many of you know this story here. So again, I was, this one was new to me. Um, in Minnesota, during the summer of 1876, swarms of grasshoppers destroyed most of the crops. The next year, fearing that the grasshoppers would return, Governor John Pillsbury proclaimed a day of prayer and fasting on April the 26th, urging every man, woman, and child to ask God for protection. When the day came, schools and businesses were closed as people prayed for divine intervention. The next day began three days that were unseasonably warm. It was more like a summer than spring. The three days of warm weather triggered the hatching of the grasshopper larva. People wondered why God had not responded to their prayers. However, the fourth day brought a sudden dip in temperatures. The entire state of Minnesota was covered with frost that night. The grasshopper larvae were killed in the frost, and the crops of Minnesota were rescued from certain devastation. That was, that was taken from a, a sermon um, entitled Power of Biblical Fasting. But I found that story kind of interesting, right? They were, they were praying for something, right? Days went by. Here we go again. Then day four... All of the all of the larvae are killed, and it's fine. Right? It reminds me of God doing things in His own time. Right? We're going to encounter problems. We're going to encounter smaller problems, bigger problems, at different times. We might have a good stretch going where things are good, everything kind of seems to be falling in place. We'll go through other stretches where it just it seems like if it, when it rains it pours. Right? My mom always told me that things break in threes right in your house. I think that's kind of true. I don't know if your experience is similar. I've heard deaths. Usually deaths come in threes. Usually well, I, I didn't say it. You said it. <laughs> well, stop counting, yeah, really what it is. well, if you don't count, if you don't keep track. Yeah, yeah. Right? People stop counting at three, though. They go, that's it. And they, and they all start over once they get to the fourth. Anyway. They do that with birthdays, too. <laughs> in fact, go back to the previous slide real quick. This one? Yeah. Yeah. So you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow of the flies of that flies by day and it keeps going. But that makes me think of uh, David. Remember when King David, uh, when he fell out of favor with God, um, he, well, because of his sin, mm -hmm. you know, there's the repercussions and then he becomes king again. He right. regains the kingship. But then he started to lose some faith and trust in God because he took a, he took a count, right? He did the, he, he, uh, he, he did the census. And when he took the census, what was that saying to God? Now I'm trusting in my own strength and numbers, where before, as long as you were faithful, it didn't matter if there was 180,000 Syrians in, in the, in, in, you know what I mean, in the, yeah. in the desert. You know, I, you could take 300 with me on your side. It doesn't matter what the number is. Yeah. 
And so that's when he fell out of favor. And so that's, that's that idea back of that trust. Are you fully trusting in God and not on your own ability sometimes? Thank you. Appreciate that. Pat, are you going to add to that? Um, I was thinking about something about David earlier and kind of led, kind of before that. But David, of course, you mentioned. But he said something about earlier about how we fall. How to, you said something about how can we fall away. I did or David did? No, it was, it was, it was a thought or something that came up that made me think about this. Made me go to that David and Bathsheba story for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe we were talking about when things get bad and go to finding shelter or going back to work. We were something along yeah, the okay. Things go bad. Go yeah, back. yeah. And I was thinking about the process of, of your mindset and how you go about doing it, right? So when David, Nathan goes to David, he talks to him about this story of this man and, you know, stealing of all the, you know, stealing the sheep, you know, having, having all this stuff. But, and David, even though David was anointed by God. He was a man of God. He fought for God. He had got let, he let himself slowly get away from that without realizing it, without you know doing a self reflection, without checking himself in the mirror. He said, "How can how can he go from that? You go from there to, to Bathsheba over here, yeah." But he but he did slowly, so much so that when Nathan told him the story, he didn't even know he was talking about him. But then once he realized it, though, he says, "Oh, I've sinned against I've sinned against God." And he changed. And it wasn't a matter of as long as things were good, as long as right. he said, you know what, I'm willing to accept the repercussions, the consequences, and I'm going to, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff happened, but I'm going to be faithful. Now, yeah, he sinned. He had his ups and downs and stuff still, but he still, for the most part, he was coming to that shelter and staying in, dwelling in that shelter. I was just reading a different scenario today. I, I don't know how I've read this many times, and it doesn't stick out the way it stuck out today. But in Jeremiah 44, Jeremiah is talking to the people before they're getting ready to take it, get taken into Babylon captivity. I guess there was a faction of people that were trying to go down to Egypt. And he says, don't go to Egypt. You're not going to be safe there. You need to go ahead and take this. That's going to happen. And he said, because if you go to Egypt, you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're not, it's not going to end up well for you there. And the people basically said, no, we're not going to listen to your prophecy from God. We're going to keep sacrificing to idols and to this queen of the whatever and we're going to do it this way we're not going to listen to you and it's like wait a minute <laughs> you realized you were wrong and you didn't like I say they didn't go back to that shelter at all and I know um, actually I don't know it's easy for all of us to be in a right relationship with God and then mess up but it's all about our mindset how we come back there and you know the willingness and the I guess the uh, humility humility will bring you back that's good. I appreciate that. I really appreciate those comments. I want to um, want to go a little bit. For I want to get to verse ten, and then I've got a couple kind of slides that I think will. I couldn't get. Russ had a ton of stuff here, so I'm. I maybe got two thirds of it in if I get through my slides. So <laughs> I want to read verse seven. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling. Conditional statement. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. So my question is, what pulls us away? We've already kind of talked about this, but what are the things that pull us out of that shelter? What is it that gets us? We've talked about it a little bit, but what pulls us away? How do we find ourselves outside of that? Worldliness, peer pressure? Fleshly desires. That's not my term, that's in the Bible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for specifying that. Good times. Yeah. Okay. When we're doing well, mm -hmm. and we don't feel the need. It's all good, right? So when we choose to walk away, I put a couple things up here, right? Are these these are some of the things, right? That could there's there's many, it's just examples, right? What are the things that can pull us away? How do we leave? How do we guard against this? How do we prevent these things? How do we get that humility to bring us back if we do find ourselves outside of the shelter, right? And and all of a sudden, I'm not covered anymore. Like how how do you bring yourself back? How do we do that?
Thanks, Lori. Prayer. Can you show that list? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I'm trigger finger here. I'm eager. I had a thought, and then you show that list, and I'm thinking. Yeah. Those ones I know for sure I got to go to God with. I get jammed up when things are calm and easy, right? I get comfortable, and I don't have anything on that list, which, you know, sounds great. But I also, my prayer life drops, and once then my gratefulness drops, and my conversation drops. Yeah. And, yeah. I think that's that's a common one. In, in several sermons I preach, I try to get the congregation to self-reflect. If you, if you're, if you're, willing to self-reflect, just like on goals, when you're willing to mm -hmm. see if you're hitting the, the mark at different points along the way, then then you could recognize you know, the weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not a lot of us slow down long enough to look for the weaknesses. Yeah. We want to look for the blame, but don't necessarily want to look for the solution or the weakness, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, I appreciate that. I was thinking we need a, a printout. We need some church analytics, like of what we, our stats, and where we can improve. Yeah. Just, like, just like my golf game. So how do we guard against these things, right? There's a story that I want to tell you. Where This is the five-minute mark. Thank you, Jim. So I want to tell you this third story. This is a short one. There's a story of a soldier in the midst of battle, really intense battle, and he's desperately trying to deepen his foxhole as the bullets are flying all around him. While digging, he finds a silver cross. Just then, someone jumps into the foxhole beside him and sees that he is an army chaplain. Holding the silver cross in front of the chaplain, he asks, hey, do you know how to work this thing? <laughs> now, it's funny, but it's also, isn't that the kind of question that we get sometimes, right, as members of the body? How can we have peace when there's turmoil all around us. Why would a, a loving God allow evil to manifest itself everywhere? Why would a loving God let these awful things happen to people? Do you know how to work this thing, right, this cross? Aren't those questions, or maybe that's a little bit of a simplification, but aren't, don't we get questions like that from people? Yes. Why, do you, why do you attend services? Why do we believe Why do you evil believe? exists? Right. Okay, we can make up answers, but you know, we we know that we brought it that Adam brought it on the human race. We know that. Um, if everything was perfect, would we know it? That's what I'm thinking. If everything was perfect, if everybody was beautiful. If everybody was healthy and well-to-do, would we know it? You know, it, would we know what ugliness is if everybody was beautiful? Would we, you know, my suspicion is that if God is standing aside, he's letting us deal with the consequences and the hopes will be driven to him because we're not in happy oblivion. Um, in Isaiah, you know, there's, it's like up and down. There's frequent passages, um, hope, then misery, um, blessing, then misery. And it's like uh, sin, re sin, ask for forgiveness, get right, repeat. Mm -hmm. And it's, and you see that all throughout the Old Testament, and it's like God wasn't very nice, uh, you know, because uh, a woman's life, or her life was in her husband's hands, you know. But I guess the bottom line is we have to deal with the consequences before we're even willing to look at him and take his relief. There are consequences for sin, right? You bring up, and that's, that's a good, well, it's here, right? We, we deal with it. Um, to to kind of just, because I'm almost out of time, I want to wrap up with this last thought or two. So I want you to think about Paul briefly. We've been in Psalms, uh, but Paul had some troubles, didn't he? He talked about it a lot, a lot of things that, that were struggles. In verse 6, I think I'm in, I thought it was Philippians. Uh, I forgot to put it up there. Um, let me read this. I think I might have it on the next slide. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
present your requests to God. Is that something we do? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul wrote that before he was awaiting trial, right? Like the, the mindset of when I think about some of the difficulties and the things that Paul went through and the persecution, being in prison, and, and these how positive, how he strove so, um, I don't know, unceasingly to maintain this relationship with God. Um, Philippians 1.20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul understood the bigger picture, right? And you read that, and when you read that about Paul, it's like, wow, I want to I want to have more of that kind of a mindset. And I am so distracted by things. Pettiness. Things that happen at work. Things that happen here. And, I, and you think about the hardship that Paul experienced, right? And just understanding that there's something bigger. There's a bigger picture. And we have something really special promised to us. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. If we prove faithful. If we follow the scripture. But we're checking ourselves. I'm thankful for you guys and the strength that you provide for me. You're an encouragement to see you here tonight. There's other things you could be doing. You're here. Um, and there's, there's a strength there. Um, and this, this is a special place here at Lincoln Park. So I hope tonight, at the very least, uh, some food for thought. Um, if you get a chance, if you have some time, spend a little time in Psalms. There's a lot of, of beauty in those passages and a lot of really important points for us, too. So thank you guys for the comments tonight. Really appreciate the, the thoughts. Very helpful. And I got through all my slides. All right, let's, let's close in prayer before we go. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again, for the opportunity to have this study. We're so thankful for uh, the discussion that we can turn to your word, that it's been preserved for us, that we have access to it. Uh, may we always think of it as, uh, as a privilege to, to be able to assemble and freely we look forward to the next time that we can meet, that you'll help us to equip our hearts, stay rooted in the word, uh, to pray continually, and to, uh, to lean on our brothers and sisters when we need them. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, the hope that we find in him. We ask that you'll forgive us when we fail, when we fall short. Please keep us humble, and may our humility always bring us back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, here's the joke, in case you were wondering. I wrote a really strongly worded email to the guy who, in, who invented the zero, and I told him, thanks for nothing. <laughs>